um, there's, there's this aspect of, um, I, I don't know how many of you experienced it or not, but my mother measured how much I loved her by how much of her food I ate. <laughs> And that was, a hard, that was a hard line to walk because her idea of proper amounts of food was like four times what I could eat. Uh, and so it was, it was really very difficult to please her in that regard. She cooked very well. Uh, usually her cakes were an absolute mess. If you watch some TV, this is after I became an adult, and she comes through there trying to poke more food at me. And I, I told her repeatedly, Mama, I'm so full I can't stand it. I, I just can't eat anymore. Please don't offer me any more food. And she would not stop. She just kept coming at me. And we, we do, and I won't tell you what happened as a result of that. It wasn't pleasant. But anyway, food is a big part of our lives. Uh, we even talk about it in terms of religion. We talk about table fellowship. You know, we, a lot of our getting together and fellowshipping with one another is, is involves food. Um, so... This is an area where we need to show some kind of temperance because, let's face it, um, <laughs> it's not good for us at times <laughs> to eat too much. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. <clears throat> a, um, a recent, say within the past couple of hundred years, the term uh, temperance literally started narrowing down, not to just food and drink, but just to the consumption of alcohol. You've heard of temperance movements, which referred to people trying to get people to abstain from drinking alcohol. Who put the, uh, the Harriman right up on my, on my table here? Thank you. Uh, I was aware of the building, but I wasn't aware of the actual full history of it. Um, if you've ever been through Harriman, You've seen a very interesting building there that almost looks like a brick castle or something. I've, I've always thought it was just fascinating building. And what was the sign out front that used to, I don't know if it's still there or not, it's, it called it something. Anybody remember? The Utopia of Temperance is what it was called. I thought that was a fascinating name. And this piece of paper that, that I was given talks about the temperance movement in Harriman and that they did not have any liquor stores in Harriman until 1993. Um, I don't know if they're, are they in a dry county or, I don't, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I, I was fascinated by that whole concept and had listed in here Harriman as, as an interesting place uh, with regard to the utopia of temperance in Harriman. But anyway, that kind of sort of changed the definition for a lot of people. But that's not exactly the way it's treated in the Bible. However, I want to look at a couple of things in, in the New Testament about food and drink. Um, if you recall, Jesus on at least two occasions fed thousands of people, which was a big deal. Um, at one point, Jesus complains about food. He says, John the Baptist came to you, and he just, all he ate was locusts and wild honey, and you thought he was crazy. Now I come, and I eat, and I drink, and I have a good time, and you call me a drunkard and a, and a, and a, a glutton. You know, what's, what's with this? You know, I can't, we can't please you no matter what. You know, so he's, he's talking about this whole eating thing. Remember, it seems like everywhere he went, he ate with people, didn't he? Almost everything he did, he ate with people. He was always at somebody's house having dinner or at a party of some sort. He was at a wedding uh, early in his ministry. Um, the... Uh, all of the big Jewish holidays were feasts for days on end. Feasts. And as you may recall, most of the sacrifices that were made were not destroyed on the sacrificial altar. They were basically barbecued and eaten. So food is everywhere in, in the Bible. I mean, you almost can't flip to a page and not see some reference to food. Well, after Jesus' resurrection, he goes out on the beach and he's talking to the guys out, out in the water. Hey, have you caught anything? Nope. 
throw them on the other side. And they go, sure, why not? They do it and they catch a ton of fish, you know. And then when they get in shore, what's he doing? He's cooking fish for them. The question comes up, how in the world do you get the fish? But that's neither here nor there. He, he could have just generated or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, come over here and get on the roof. <laughs> so there you go. Um, so there are many, many cases of food being associated with, with the scriptures. In fact, as, as I mentioned, one of, the, one of the holidays was the Passover, and what did they do? It was a feast where they ate this solemn feast. It wasn't exactly what you would call a great feast because it had some odd things in it that you wouldn't particularly find pleasant. Um, but... What came from that? What came from the Passover feast? What, what's significant to us today? Now, we, we have gotten to the point to where we just take a little piece of bread and a little piece of juice, you know, just a little bit of this, that, and the other, but this is actually a spiritual feast here. We are eating. We might say symbolically the body and blood of Jesus Christ, but he didn't refer to it symbolically. He says this is. And in fact, the Catholic Church has taken it so far till they believe that it is transubstantiated into the actual blood and body of Jesus Christ. So much so that they can't allow a crumb or a drop to hit the ground once they've done it. If you've ever watched that, they have this a person standing there just in case a drop gets lost or something or a crumb gets dropped. So food was, is big. There are a few Proverbs that are interesting. Uh, Proverbs 23, uh, verses 30 through 32, I'll just read them quickly. Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine, do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly, in the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Another proverb, 25, 16. If you find honey, eat just enough. Too much of it and you'll vomit. <laughs> That's pretty obvious. Um, so there are problems with too much or the wrong kind of food and drink. What are these problems? What happens if you eat too much? How do you feel? I just, oh, I'm so full, I can hardly breathe, I feel terrible, I wish I hadn't eaten so much. And when we go to do it the next time, what do we do? We eat too much again, you know. So there's this problem that we have with eating too much causes discomfort, it can call, it, it cause ill health, the most obvious of which is obesity perhaps. It's wasteful to eat too much food. The mother's acclamation that, you know, eat, there are people starving in China. I'm sorry to tell you this, but they are not starving in China, and you eating that is not going to help them at all. But, you know, we used to get that. Um, and, and wastefulness of, of food is inappropriate. In fact, the, the Marines on, in their dining halls have a sign. Anybody know what it says? And other military groups. Do what? Take all you want, eat all you take. In other words, don't waste it. If you're going to take it, eat it. Um, when the little kids in our congregation here are going through the line, through a, a dinner in the back, <laughs> they take five times more food than they can eat. And sometimes I wonder why the parents don't go, Honey, uh, you can have this, this, and this. You don't need to take a plate of food this high. I can't eat that much, you know. Um, and so they, the little children are bad to do that. They think they can eat 12 pieces of pizza. You know, and they'll take like three, 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 three bites of pizza, three, and then throw the rest of it away. So anyway, um, it, it has a high cost if you eat too much, and there are even um, um, spiritual issues associated with, with what you eat. Uh, Romans 14, Paul talks about eating meat and drinking wine, and he says, if that's going to give my brother a problem, I don't, I'm not going to do either one of those, even though I have the right to do it. Spiritual aspect of eating. Um, We've get developed through the years the, the tradition of always having a, a, a blessing before we eat. And many of us would feel like the food was rotten if we didn't have a blessing before we ate it. Uh, the, uh, so we, we have all kinds of traditions that, that surround our consumption of food. Um, 
there's one other example of where Daniel and his buddies are in the king's court and the king decides to honor them and, and educate them and bring them up in, in the knowledge of, of, of his kingdom and he is feeding them at his table. And it talked about the king's dainties, which were probably very odd and exotic foods. And Daniel says, don't feed us that. Feed us just vegetables, stew. And they ate that, and they were more healthy looking than, than the king's uh, other people were. So many, many uh, ideas about food in, in the Bible. Um, so as I mentioned, Franklin thought he could get his, um, uh, if he could get his eating under control, the rest of self-control would, fo uh, would follow into uh, uh, his achieving his other virtues. Um, but what I want to do here is I want to expand it. Uh, I don't want to just deal with food as, as an idea of temperance. I want to deal with temperance as the Bible treats temperance. Um, the word that is usually translated temperance or self-control and sometimes self-discipline it's not always, but quite often, it is a word that it has two different spellings. It's egkratia or inkratia. Um, the egg in part means uh, inward self, that sort of thing. And kratia is control or power or that sort of thing. So self-control, self-power. Uh, you are in control. Uh, we get a, a, a common word. Uh, from this kratia word, demo or demos means people in Greek. Demos kratia means, do you hear the word? Democracy, meaning people control, people rule, people power. So the actual word democracy comes from Greek and means people having the power uh, in that case. So, Anyway, that word comes out usually, depending on the version, uh, as either self-control or temperance or something like that. And, and it is exactly the opposite of what we would refer to as uncontrolled self-gratification. Um, thought I saw a hand go up, but you were just scratching, right? <laughs> okay, so that's what the word generally means. And there are numerous scriptures, uh, some of which we may or may not have time to read this morning, that refer to the idea of temperance or self-control. Proverbs has, has quite a few, but I, I just grabbed one. Proverbs 25, 28 says, Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. You're, you're just lost. I mean, if your, your walls are down, your defenses are gone, you, you have no, people can just come and do whatever they want to because you have no self-control, you have no, no, no ability to control yourself at all. Galatians uh, 5, starting in verse 22, are, are the fruits of the Spirit. And one of those fruits of the Spirit is, depending on which version you're reading, uh, it's the last one, it's either temperance or self-control, depending on which version you're reading. Um, and it says that you can uh, do that as much as you want to. There's no law against it. Um, and the last few words here, it says, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Second Peter uh, 1, verse 5 and following, uh, another famous one, he talks about, he says, Besides this, give all diligence to adding to your faith virtue, which is the general term for goodness in this case. Uh, and so he, kind of, whoop, I forgot, I, that came, went down. So virtue is basically doing goodness, doing good things. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. And to godliness brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness charity or, or love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. So we have a, um, a strong encouragement here to develop all of these various characteristics, one of which is temperance, the ability to provide yourself with self-control and have yourself under control, um, to be... Um, uh, fruitful, 
and strong in the knowledge of the Lord. Titus 2, verse 11 and 12, um, uh, says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Um, Do we see a lot of self-control nowadays? I certainly don't see it on TV and in, and in uh, you know, the, the news and, and people around me. Um, yeah, look at the way they drive. Um, there's, there are people who will do anything nowadays. I mean anything. Uh, there have been people who were murdered for their tennis shoes, and the person gave no thought to the consequences of committing murder. They just wanted tennis shoes. That's basically an animal. An animal has no self-control whatsoever. It sees food, it wants it, it takes it, if it can. It, it, animals are not environmentalists, by the way. They will destroy an environment utterly without a second thought. They have no self-control whatsoever. In fact, the environment controls them. Because when they run out of food, what happens? They either move on or die, right? They don't care. And, and I'm afraid that a lot of people are like that now. They don't give any second thought to consequences or to what this might mean to me later or to them later or to other people later. They just want and do. And it's very, very sad to see that um, because they could very easily improve their lives by just having a little bit of self-control, just a little bit of self-control. Um, kids uh, in, in the boys' club, when I would be working with them, a child would lay a, stupidly lay a crumpled up dollar bill on the corner of the table next to them, and another kid would come by and take it, and I would say, give that dollar back. What dollar? The dollar in your hand? It's mine. How do you know it's yours? Well, it was just sitting there. Well, again, how do you know it was yours? Well, it was just sitting there. That doesn't make it yours. <laughs> just because it was just sitting there, that makes it somebody else's since you didn't bring it in here. Well, I, I just thought it was mine. You didn't think at all. You got no self-control. You just stole from somebody without giving it a second thought. You know, no second thought to anything. All kinds of craziness going on. That's minor, of course, but, but it is descriptive and indicative of, of the way that many people think nowadays. <clears throat> okay, so if we're going to practice a self-controlled life, um, where else beside food should we practice self-control? I, I readily admit I have, to, I, I have a hard time doing self-control with food. And I'm, when we were on that five-week cruise through Greenland and Iceland and across to Europe and back and everything. I worked really hard, but I failed. <laughs> I mean, I would get up in the morning, I would go to breakfast. No, I would get up in the morning and I would go to pre-breakfast. And then we would have breakfast after pre-breakfast. And then I would go back to the room and take a nap and get up just in time to get dressed and go to lunch. And then I would come back to the room, take another nap, and get up just in time for an afternoon snack and then go back to bed and sleep for another hour or two. Get up, get dressed, because you had to kind of dress up a little bit for supper. They don't require you to dress formally every night anymore like they used to, but you, you know, you want to put on something a little nicer than flip-flops and tennis shoes, or flip-flops and uh, shorts and a t-shirt to go down to the main dining room. Uh, and so we would get up, get dressed, and go to dinner. And then we'd come back and go to bed. <laughs> so we slept and ate, slept and ate, slept and ate, slept and ate. Uh, the average person on a cruise gains, does anybody know how much they gain on average per day? Average. One pound a day. I was really good. I only gained a third of a pound a day. And I was working hard. But you know, when you walk by that, that ice cream, it's called a gidunk, by the way, in the military world. When you go by that ice cream bar and that, and that dessert bar that's there 24 hours a day, it is hard to turn down that ice cream. 
There were, there were a couple of days I counted. I had five large servings of ice cream in one day, and I was holding back. <laughs> so you can imagine how bad that is. But anyway, there are other areas that we need to practice self-control in. By the way, I am starting to lose the, the 11 pounds that I gained. I'm down about four pounds or so, and I'm still coming down a little bit more, but it's not easy to come out of that. Okay, the tongue is another area that we need to have self-control in. This is hard for all of us. It's especially hard for me to control my tongue. And if you recall, James talks about it. He says, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. That's, that's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? If you can control your tongue, you can control every aspect of your life. Maybe that's what he should have started with as his virtue, is controlling his tongue. In fact, that, our next lesson is going to be the subject of silence, which is essentially controlling your tongue. That will be the next one in order uh, coming through here. But he says, if you can control your tongue so that you never say the wrong thing, you've got, you're perfect. Matthew 5.18 it, uh, he says, the things that come out, Jesus is speaking, that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. He was talking about food and things, uh, but he says, now, what defiles you is the stuff that comes out of your mouth. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, and then he lists several uh, examples of those evil thoughts. So self-control of the tongue is really important. And I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I'm not in very good control of that. I'm, I'm not good at it. I wish I could be. Um, but it's, uh, it's one of those very, very difficult things to do. But we need to control our tongue. And nobody can control it but you. There's nobody out there that can make you not talk, unless they cut your tongue out, I guess. But um, that would be a little extreme. Uh, related to controlling our tongue is our thoughts. Romans 13, uh, verse 14, says, uh, To clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. In other words, don't spend all of your time thinking about how you can get more stuff, more food, more fun, more this, more that. While that may be pleasurable at the, at the moment, that's not what makes up life. That only, that's only worth doing on, on, you know, as your goal if this is it. Uh, if this is it, that, that's, you should do that. You know, whatever brings you the most comfort and pleasure. If, if this is it, but this is not it. Um, so we need to control our thoughts and, and not spend all of our time thinking about how to... Um, to gratify the, the desires of our flesh. Uh, Philippians 4.8 um, is an excellent uh, verse. It says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, uh, different versions use different terms there. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's, that's important. How much of your time do you spend thinking about things that are noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy? How much time do we spend thinking about things like that? Or do we spend our time thinking about other kinds of things all the time? People say, well, I work. I have to think about work. Well, you can do those kinds of thoughts at work, too, you know. Good work is praiseworthy, and it's excellent. You know? um, think about good... It's basically good things to think about. What do they say in the computer world of, about programming? Garbage in, garbage out. And that's exactly true. If, you, if you've ever done any programming at all, you put garbage in, you get total garbage back out. It doesn't give you what you expected. This happens with your brain, too. Your brain's a computer. You put garbage in, guess what you get back out? Garbage. You want garbage coming out of your brain and out of your mouth? I don't. But, again, we all fail at one time or another. We get to thinking negatively. Um, now, and I'm not talking about a person who is um, suffering from... Uh, a, biological issues that cause them to be depressed or anything like I mean that happens and, and it's impossible to overcome it 
uh, directly. It's, it's a, in many cases, it's biologically caused by the chemistry in the person. But, you know, if you spend all your time wanting to be depressed, <laughs> sad about everything, and always thinking negative thoughts about other people, when you have the power to control it, again, I'm not talking about people who can't control it. They, I feel sad for them. God loves them very, very much, as He does all of us. But well, we should think positively about that all the time, shouldn't we? We should always be thinking positively about Jesus' gift to us and everything. We should be happy, or try to be. Paul talked about being content, regardless of what kind of situation he lived in. He says, I've been rich and I've been poor. He didn't say rich is better, but, but he said, I, I, I'm content no matter where I am. Um, but we need to focus our thoughts rather than having them focused on, on sadness and unpleasant things. We need to focus our thoughts more on positive, useful, valuable, uplifting, good, praiseworthy things. This will help us to, to live better lives overall. And it will also show us opportunities for doing good. If you're always thinking bad things about other people, when are you ever going to think of a good thing you could do for somebody? Because they're bad. I don't want to help them. You know, we don't, we don't need to be thinking like that. Um, a, a, again, sort of related to this is our anger and our temper. And they're mad because they don't have anything to be mad about. They're just unhappy mad. They're mad at everything. And we need to be able to control that. Um, it, um, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, he's talking about love. And he says, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Uh, Ephesians 4.26 says, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. That recognizes that people get mad. But it says, don't fester it. Get over it. Get past it. Move on. Um, Ephesians 4.31 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Uh, it's mentioned again in Colossians 3.8. You should rid yourself of all such things as anger and rage, along with several other things. First Timothy 2.8, I want the men everywhere to pray. Now, this is an interesting place to put it. I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. In other words, some people even pray angry. That's what I just read, sweetie. Um, but, and that... But some people pray angry. Now, there are times that you're going to be mad at God, and that's okay. He can handle it, okay? God can handle it. But if you acknowledge your anger at God, He'll help you get past it. But He, he wants people to pray not with anger or rage but, or disputing, just pray. Um, James 1, verse 19 and 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. We'll bring that one back up next week, probably. Slow to becoming angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So anger is something we need to have under control within ourselves. There's another one uh, that I picked up on, and that's appearance. Some people don't seem to have any control of their appearance. And I'm not talking about dressing expensively or anything. I'm talking about dressing appropriately. Uh, there are times that you can be o way overdressed and you draw undue attention to yourself. Or you could be way underdressed and draw undue attention to yourself. It's most appropriate to not try to draw undue attention to yourself by the way you dress. Uh, if, if you just dress however you bloody well feel like everywhere you go, you might, people are going to think strangely of you, I'm afraid. Um, so as a result, you know, you shouldn't show up here at church in a bathing suit, okay? That's pretty inappropriate. 
And I showed up here some years ago in a tux because Tyra and I had, had had a wedding anniversary and she was able to get in her wedding dress after 25 years. And I was able to get into any tux, maybe, after 25, some tuxes after 25 years. And I was just bound and determined I was going to wear that tux because I had it for the whole weekend. She didn't wear her wedding dress on church. And it actually drew undue attention. In fact, Jack McCamus was leading songs and he, he looked over there and he made me stand up. And it was very embarrassing, and I shouldn't have worn it to church because it was too much. Too much. I was just getting my money's worth. That's right. My son, who's a professor of biology in Georgia, in Atlanta, uh, was teaching a class one day, and this young woman came into the class dressed beyond unimaginably inappropriate. And I don't know if he waited until the class was over or if he confronted her immediately, but he told her that she was not welcome back in his class dressed that way. It was inappropriate for a learning environment. She complained to the uh, lady in charge of human resources and issued a sexual harassment complaint against him. My son's pretty smart. He looked at the woman that was in... Um, human resources and said, you don't want to pursue this because you're going to lose your job before I'm done with you. And she pursued it and she almost lost her job. He was vindicated because the people who should have been filing the sexual harassment charge were the students and Jonathan. They were the ones being harassed, not the girl there with no clothes on, effectively. You know, just walking around just dressed filthily, you know, and, and totally inappropriately. That's not self-control. We need to have self-control in our appearance. And this apply and the classic scripture is in second first Timothy two. He talks about he wants the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Now, I've seen this said, well, you can't wear jewelry. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, don't let that be what people see you as. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have jewelry and, and wear nice clothes and, <laughs> and have a pretty hairstyle, ladies, or expensive clothes, but don't let that be what defines you. And without even a second thought, I can say that equally applies to men without even a second thought. Dress appropriately and modestly and in control of your appearance. Yes? Over the years, I've seen a tremendous change in the attitude of people, particularly going to funerals. Yes. And that they, used to be a super dressing time. Well, it was out of respect for the deceased and the family. It was. And today, it's, uh, it doesn't seem to affect people in any way. Yeah, I, I, I'm sort of of the opinion that shorts and t-shirt flip-flops or tennis shoes are a little bit too much for that. Um, I've, I've gone to a funeral dressed like this, but you know, I'm on the low side when I do that. Most people are wearing coats and ties and things like that. We used to also wear coats and ties to church all the time. And we've kind of quit doing that, but I'm also for that. Um, we've talked about that in the past here, about somebody that used to come here said, I think you should wear your best for God. Well, there are people who find that intimidating, by the way. If they see too many people in coats and ties, they are intimidated by that because they don't have coats and ties. In fact, we have a specific example, I believe, in our congregation just a few weeks ago of where that happened. They chose us because they didn't see too many coats and ties as opposed to another group where they saw nothing but coats and ties. So there is, there is a benefit to that. Besides, I'm pretty sure that God doesn't notice that you even have clothes on. In fact, I'm pretty sure He doesn't even notice that you have a body when He looks at you because God looks at that bright, shining light, I can't describe it any other way, called your spirit. And He sees that. He's not really looking at your clothes. But, again, we don't need to dress so far out of the norm of, the, of, of where we go that it draws undue attention to ourselves. But there is an argument for the respect aspect um, in that regard. Another thing that has changed considerably over the years 
a lot of congregations, uh, the standard was to wait on the Lord's table, you wore a coat and tie. Yeah, and then it we kind of got it back. Then it digressed down to just wearing a tie. Yeah, and it went from there to a sport coat or just a, a, a nice shirt. And it's gone beyond that. <clears throat> Very quickly, uh, we're not alone in our quest for self control. One verse. 2 Timothy 1 7. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self control. So, with God's power, we can achieve to a very large measure good self control. Um, next week, we'll do silence, uh, which also has a, a very broad application. Um, and by way of benediction, may you allow God to give you the power to be self controlled and may you use that power through Christ our Lord.